الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. All praise is due to Allah, the only Creator, Sustainer, and Cherisher of the universe, the Lord of all mankind, and may His peace and blessing be upon His last Messenger and Prophet Muhammad, and upon all prophets and messengers before him, also upon all of those who followed their path of guidance until the Day of Judgment. I greet you all with the Islamic greeting, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, which means me, peace, blessing, and mercy of Allah be with you all. I'd have to begin by expressing my gratitude, first of all, to be amongst you, and also for the two basic themes that seem to have been apparent in the previous presentations. One is living in harmony, uh, somehow emulating a tropical fish, if I may borrow the term and secondly the theme also of education and I think both themes are interrelated and in an attempt to keep within the same theme also I thought that we might as well highlight some of the specific areas where mutual understanding and harmony is needed areas of misconceptions about Islam that are quite rampant in the West well uh, if you want to make a list of that, uh, or the number of those misconceptions, perhaps they might run into the hundreds, yet I try to limit myself to five major areas only by way of outline in the hope that with the brief presentation there will be sufficient time uh, for questions and clarification. And the five area, uh, areas I chose are some theological questions, secondly the question of jihad, violence, and terrorism, spread of Islam, these are all basically one topic. Thirdly, the issue of uh, human rights. Fourthly, the nature of uh, criminal punishments in Islam. And last but not least, the issue of women in Islam and their position. But before proceeding further, I think that it would be honest to say that there are a number of reasons for these misconceptions and Muslims should not throw the blame always on others. Part of the misunderstanding may be due to historical legacy that resulted in sometimes attempted falsification and misrepresentation of others or giving a false witness. And this is definitely a factor. But I must say that uh, other important reasons for misconceptions relate mainly to the misbehavior of some Muslims in the name of Islam sometimes even, as well as the misunderstanding of Muslims, especially in centuries of decline of Muslim culture and Muslim understanding. So I hope that we are approaching that with a balanced approach. Let me turn to the first issue on uh, theological questions, and I limit myself only to four. In fact, I was not planning to cover that at all. But last night while watching a program, I think it's called After Dark, uh, I noted something that really amazed me. I thought uh, what I was going to say was so much repeated and there's no need really to mention it. That in one of the discussions, uh, a speaker was saying that maybe when you encounter Muslims or Buddhists or others, you compare with them, tell them, my God was crucified and rose from the death. Did yours, did Muhammad? Which uh, was really a surprise to me of, of highly intellectual people, some are highly educated in the matters of religion would make such kind of uh, statement. So I'll just address uh, four points here. One, uh, the notion of Muslim worshipping Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that to them is that just like the segment of Christian that literally believed that Jesus indeed was God in human form, which is absolutely incorrect. Uh, secondly, there are some uh, allegations sometimes that Islam carried over in its teaching some of the pagan practices. First, they say that the term Allah was known already to pagan Arabs and somehow uh, the Prophet adopted it. And what has been forgotten is that Islam was introduced into Arabia not by Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. It was introduced before even by Prophet Abraham 
who was a strict monotheist, and the term Allah means simply the one and only true God of all. Now, if the Arabs perverted the use of the meaning of Allah, or if they believed in idols as intercessors between mankind and the sole creator, that does not reflect on Islam. The same thing when it is said that some of the practices of Muslims in pilgrimage is similar to what the pagans used to do. But did pilgrimage begin with paganism? Pilgrimage began with Abraham and Ishmael. So some of the practices of the pre-Islamic Arabs was in line with what Prophet Abraham did. Some were perverted. Islam came to purify it and restore it to what it was at the time of uh, Prophet Abraham. Uh, sometimes a very simplistic statement made that Muslims destroyed all the idols in Kaaba, but they uh, maintained only one, the black stone, forgetting that the black stone was never regarded as an idol, and it has absolutely no significance, except that this is a relic from the days of Prophet Abraham. Just as one kisses his child by way of love, it does not mean that you worship the child. So if a person kisses the black stone or touch it by way of remembering the monotheistic patriarch of old Abraham, it has absolutely no connection with worship. Actually, the majority of pilgrims have no access even to touch the black stone. It's just the beginning of the circumambulation around the Kaaba. Uh, similarly, there have been also some um, uh, allegations made even by uh, writings that has the aura of scholarship, like uh, Montgomery Watts and others, uh, when it is alleged that at one point Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was inclined to make some compromise uh, with the pagans and giving some credence to their gods. And they refer to a story that has proven to be a very weak and unauthentic story, even though it may exist in some Muslim sources known as the theory of the so-called uh, satanic verses. I think that might ring a bell. And uh, any scholarly uh, evaluation of that, which has been done on the basis of external and internal evidence and critical historical analysis, show that the story is, the way it's presented, of course, by Orientalists, is totally false. And that what has happened, in all likelihood, was the fact that the Quran, as we find in many other precedents, was so striking in its influence, even on the pagan Arabs, because of the beauty and the striking style of the Quran, that in the Surah Al-Najm, Surah number 53 in the Quran, when the Prophet was reciting that around the Kaaba, it struck the pagan Arab so much that they could not help but prostrate when Muslim prostrated to God when the uh, place for prostration came. And uh, found that later on they were stuck. On one hand, they have been accusing Prophet Muhammad of making the Quran of his own rather than receiving it from Allah. And now, they showed their weakness and the influence on the Quran on them. And this is not the only incident when this happened. Similar incidents showed that they used to sneak at night to listen to the recitation of the Quran, even though they tell people, no, no, it's false. It's written by Muhammad. It's just like typical statements that you find in polemical literature today. And in order to get out of that dilemma that they put themselves into, they started creating a false story that, no, no, we heard the Prophet praising our, uh, our idols, even though the literal analysis and the style, if you read in Surah Najm, has absolutely nothing to do with this so-called invented satanic uh, verses. However, it is unfortunate, again, to find that this historical legacy and the attitude of prejudice and distortion lead many otherwise good scholars, solid scholars, to stick to unauthentic story and make a big uh, mountain out of that very small mall, which should be actually rejected even on a scholarly basis, regardless of the religion of the researcher himself. Uh, fourthly, one more point before moving to other practical issues that face communities here and uh, threaten their, dis uh, their harmony, is the issue of uh, relationship between Muslims and Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. The assumption made implicitly or explicitly in writings, in books, sometimes from pulpits, that Muslims are anti-Christ and that Islam teaches that you should not have any friendship with the people of the book, i.e. Jews and Christians. Let me respond to both. First of all, both of them are myths. The first one, in uh, terms of relationship with Christ, Muslims do believe and respect and love Jesus, peace be upon him, even though they do not share with many of their Christian brethren the fact that he was God in human form. They believe in him a, as a holy and respected prophet, and Muslims actually regard him as their own prophet. They regard all prophets as brethren, links in the same chain of divine revelation that God chose to reveal his will throughout humanity to the various uh, sectors of mankind. 
But the second part is even misunderstood by some Muslims, sometimes due to mistranslation of the Quran or lack of the taste of the pure Arabic original of the Quran. Sometimes uh, a translation in English of the Quran is given that do not take Jews and Christian for friends. This has proven to be a very mistaken translation because the Quran does not say friends, it says awliya. And awliya in Arabic, that allies, means allies, people to look up to for protection and alliance. But it does not speak about friendship. Suffice to say that the Quran makes it clear that you can have friendship without compromising on principles. In fact, Islam allowed the Muslim male to get married to uh, a woman from the people of the book, a believing, chaste woman from the people of the book. And if you say that marital relationship does not require friendship, then I don't know where else. Islam allowed the Muslim to eat the meat killed by a Jew or Christian, but not to be uh, meat that is killed by an atheist or a polytheist. These are only a few examples of some very common theological misconception. And of course, when you speak about a society where uh, people have a deeper religious belief, at least some, I know it's not all, it's not, it may not be the majority, but some, this kind of misunderstanding might uh, explain the deeper resentment sometimes of something which is not really clearly uh, understood. The second issue pertains to the question of uh, jihad. The first assumption that seemed to be made, especially in the media, that Islam by its very nature is a militant religion. War and fighting and violence is the basic rule. Peace is the exception. Actually, if you look at it objectively, you find that exactly the opposite is true that in all the terminology and theology of Islam, peace uh, figures very prominently. First of all, the very name Islam itself comes from a root in Arabic that connotes peace and submission. Properly defined, Islam is achieving peace with God, within oneself, and with others through submission to the Creator of all, accepting His grace and guidance. One of the fundamental names of Allah, Allah means God, capital G, at least in, as understood by mono, uh, monotheist people, one of the names of Allah in the Quran is As-Salam, peace, that's the source of peace. The ultimate objective of any Muslim is to go to paradise, and that is called the abode of peace. The greeting of Muslim that they are taught theologically is to say, not hi or hello, which I don't know whether it has any particular meaning, but As-Salamu Alaikum, may peace, blessing, and mercy of Allah be with you. So peace again figures in the uh, teaching of the day-to-day -day, uh, addressing of each other. Uh, the Quran describes that when believers get into paradise, they were greeted by the angels, peace be with you. That when they greet each other, they greet each other with the greeting of peace. But again, just to remove that notion of the peace being the exception, it is the rule actually, uh, I would like just to go beyond terminology. Some people would say that's fine and dandy. Well, how about jihad, holy war? I must say first of all, there is nothing in Islam called holy war. That might sound shocking to some. Let's take it etymologically. Translate the English term holy war into Arabic again, and the translation is harb muqaddasa. Harb muqaddasa. I assure you, my brothers and sisters, that this term never occurred in the Quran from A to Z. Nowhere can that term be found in the Quran. Nowhere can that term be found in any saying of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that I know of. The proper term is jihad. And you have to understand jihad, you have to get to the etymology of the word itself. It comes from the Arabic root that connotes exertion of effort, to strive or struggle in the path of God. Which means actually you have three levels of jihad in Islamic terminology. One is known as jihad nafs to struggle or strive against oneself, that is against evil within oneself. To struggle for excellence, for self-purification, for relationship with the Creator. And that is the foundation of any other level of jihad. You have to have that jihad against yourself, against evil inclination in the human nature. There is secondly jihad on the social level, by ordaining everything that's good, just, and decent, by trying to forbid everything that's indecent and unjust, to fight against injustice and oppression. And this is a form of jihad. In fact, one form of that jihad could be simply by the pen. You can make jihad by the pen. One interesting citation in the Quran that amplify this point, addressing Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, it says, فَلَا تُطِعِ الْكَافِرِينَ وَجَاهِدْهُمْ بِهِ جِهَادًا كَبِيرًا Don't obey the unbelievers or messenger, 
and make jihad against them. With what? Bihi, with this, with the Quran. We all know that the Quran does not emit bullets, throw bombs or missiles. <coughs> Means jihad with the Quran is jihad with the truthfulness of the Quran, with the evidence, with the proof, with the argument that meets both the rational needs as well as the emotional, spiritual and mysterious needs of the human being. The truth, make jihad with the truth. Of course, there is a third level of jihad, there is no doubt. And that is jihad in the battlefield when the need arises. But again, that is not left to the interpretation of Muslims, unless, of course, they deviate from Islam. But theologically speaking, jihad in the third level, in the battlefield, carrying arms, is allowed only under two conditions, one or two conditions. The first is jihad for self-defense. And I don't think there is any need to justify that. I don't think that anyone could say that the, the West was wrong in standing up against the Nazi menace, for example. There's no question about that. Islam does not regard self-defense of one's country, one's honor, one's rights as a uh, right. Actually, it is a moral obligation. The other condition is to remove any tyranny or arbitrary authorita authoritative oppressive powers in the world standing in the way between Muslims and the peaceful underlying communication of the message of Islam as they are ordained in the Quran. For that reason, we find that even if Muslims have to go to the battle, there are a number of conditions. First of all, what is the intention? That question was answered by Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when he was asked, which one of these people can be said to be making struggle or even fighting in the path or in the way of Allah? The one who fights because of booty, war booty, the one who fights so that people would say he's courageous, the one who fights simply by way of supporting his people, nationalism you call it today, asabiyya, my people right or wrong, which one is in the way of God? His answer was very clear and concise. Only those who fight so that the word of God, the word of Allah becomes supreme are fighting in the path of Allah. Secondly, to amplify that intention again, any intention towards compelling or forcing Islam on others is totally and clearly rejected in the Quran. In Surah number two, in the Quran, towards the end, it says, La ikraha fi din. There is no or let be no compulsion in religion. And this is not the only verse in the Quran. Remind, it addresses Prophet Muhammad. You are only a reminder. You are not a guardian over them. You simply have a duty to say, all right, this is the last revelation revealed by Allah. I am the last messenger of Allah. Let people decide for their own. It is their own destiny in this life and the hereafter after all. Even if you have to go to the battlefield, it says that you have to make sure that all peaceful solutions, peaceful and just, because you can have peace at any price, peaceful and just solution to your problems can be achieved first. One time Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, noted that when he was going for one of the battles that the companions were very anxious like you know now we'll get them we'll go very anxious to get into the battlefield he disliked that he said don't be so anxious to meet the enemy and seek security and peace from allah but if you have to face the enemy then persevere that is and show courage the behavior also even if there is need for defense or otherwise in a similar situation removal of oppression that the behavior is exemplary and it is amazing to find that the Geneva Convention on Warfare did not add much to what Prophet Muhammad and his companions taught 1400 years ago. He taught, first of all, that you go in the name of Allah. <clears throat> don't betray, that is, if you make a commitment or treaty, don't betray that and just sneak whenever people are not uh, taking heed. Uh, then when you fight, you don't kill women. And there are many, there is more than one difference in the Quran, don't kill women children, old people, even young people who are religious people like monks who are devoting themselves for religious worship. Don't cut even a tree or kill an animal except for food. Unless there is any strategic or other reason, you don't just go up plundering and killing. Don't finish an injured uh, person from the enemy. If he's dead, you cannot mutilate his body. You should let it be buried in dignity. If you have war prisoners, you have no right to torture them. And actually, you have either to release them as an act of charity if there is no threat to your security. You can release them for ransom. 
And one of the most noble things that Prophet Muhammad وسلم, did in one case is a very constructive and positive approach by offering the prisoners of war among the unbelievers to, be, to take their freedom back if they teach 10 Muslims how to read or write. Look at the constructive approach. No torture, humane treatment, but benefit others and you're free. So everybody benefit Muslims and non-Muslims alike. In one occasion, even many of those war prisoners embraced Islam because they noted that their own captors are giving them the better food. Imagine the prisoner being given the better food and the captors are taking the rougher food uh, for themselves. But some people might say this is very nice and dandy. How about if Muslims are victorious? Is there any restriction on their behavior? The answer is yes. And look at the behavior of Prophet Muhammad When he entered Mecca with 10,000 strong army and Quraysh collapsed, the defenses of Quraysh, they actually withdrew to their homes. He could have gone there, plundered. He could have gone like any victorious general raising his head. He was lowering his head in prostration until it touched his own camel. And then he gathered the people around the Kaaba, these formal persecutors and killers of Muslims with the exception of very rare cases of absolute and uh, you know, excessive cruelty that was committed against Muslims, he gathered the rest who were persecutors of Muslims. And they, he said to them, in full victory and power, what do you think I'm going to do to you? They said you are an honored son and the son of an honored father. He said, you all go, you are all free. The famous word, you are all go, you are all free. It was this that resulted in the massive acceptance of Islam on their part. But some people might say, how do we apply this very nice principles? How does it relate to the modern world when we hear about acts of terrorism? I must first of all say is that if an act, a military act or violent act, violate those principles laid down in the Quran and Sunnah, it is non-Islamic, no matter what title you give it to it. Call it jihad Islamic, it is, has nothing to do with the true jihad, nothing to do with Islam. Anything that violates the teaching of Islam, it is the problem of the one who's committing it, no matter what title he gives himself, no matter what religious background he comes from. So we have to be clear on that. But I must add also that this cruel acts, such as uh, hijacking airplanes, bombarding them, car bombs that destroy the lives of many innocent people, bystanders did not just come from thin air and if we were to condemn them and we must condemn them we must also condemn all forms of terrorism done by all all people who claim to belong to other religions as Islam cannot be blamed for this act of terrorism done by people who carry Muslim names I am sure that sensible Christians Protestant or Catholics would not necessarily agree with the violence that is going on in Ireland and Jesus Christ has nothing to do with this, even though some people might give it a religious connotation. We have to have that fair and equal standard when we talk about issues that affect all and acts that are committed by all. Is religion responsible for that? But why in the case of Islam it's always connotated with terrorism to the point that in North America we find sometimes people speak about the term even Islamic terrorism. Islamic not just Muslim, or some Muslim committing Islamic terrorism. This is something that goes hand in hand with the teaching of Islam. When we condemn terrorism, we have also to condemn state terrorism. What is going now on in occupied Palestine, burying people alive, shooting to death children as young as two years old, aborting thousands of women because of the use of the uh, tear gas, uh, deliberately breaking limbs, and all of this killing that goes on and on. This is nothing also but terrorism. I'm sure Moses, peace be upon him, is not responsible for that. But if we were to condemn one act of terrorism, let's condemn all. If we condemn individual terrorism, we have to condemn all individual as well as uh, state terrorism as well. Now, there is another aspect perhaps that need to be added before we move from the issue of terrorism. While the position has been made quite clear as to where Islam stands with respect to terrorism, we must understand that that wrong terrorism resulted from injustices and from driving people to the wall. When you put a, drive a cat to the wall, to the corner, it's got to, to scratch you. And the injustices that has been done in many parts of the world, I'm not only referring to the case of Palestinian people, many injustices around the world, the disregard of the rights and the dignity for decades, 
the birth of several generations in a very humiliating and cruel situation of refugee camps is likely to give rise to this. I'm not saying it's right, but we know from human experience that people will, under these circumstances, may forget even what their faith is teaching them. And if we were to deal constructively with the problem of terrorism, which is against Islam and against any sensible uh, belief of any person in the world, even non-religious, I think we've got to deal with the roots also that gave rise to this terrorism, minimize the reason why people get driven into this unfortunate act. One final issue on this question of jihad also, some people might say, but how do you explain the spread of Islam? I must say that the notion of Islam having been spread by the sword as evaluated by one Western author, Delasi O'Leary himself, he said it's one of the greatest myths that historians have ever repeated. I think better scholars now have a different explanation of how Islam spread. To begin with, we have seen that on the theological level, Islam forbids forcing Islam on other people. Secondly, we have seen also that historically speaking, that before even Islam fought against the superpowers of the time, the Persian and Byzantian Empire, in fact, there were peaceful invitation for them that were sent by Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But we know that certain incidents showed their aggressive attitude. Some of them killed the messenger that Prophet Muhammad sent to them. And you know, in international law, even today, if you send an ambassador and the other country kills that ambassador, it's, act, it's an act of war. It's a very clear expression of aggressive attitude. One ruler in Rome, uh, on, in, the, in the Byzantine Empire, wrote to his local governor, Bazan, in Yemen, and he said, I heard that, that an Arab came from that desert claiming to be a prophet. Does he say that, in, and he's my slave servant? go and ask him to repent or else bring me his head. There have been instances of Muslims who went peacefully to preach Islam. They were murdered and killed. Now, with this kind of attitude, it, the intention of the superpowers, or at least the rulers, who subjected their own subject even <coughs> to all kinds of cruelties, uh, cannot really continue to have their imposition and oppression of the people. That is why you find that the fighting actually was not against the populace themselves, it was against the oppressive armies. And the greatest manifestation admitted by many historians, including uh, the British writer and missionary, who worked for many years as a missionary in India, Sir Thomas Arnold, in his book, Preaching of Islam, he admitted, like many historians, that the Egyptian Christians were actually helping and welcoming the invading Muslim army against the so-called co-religionists because they found much more freedom of religion and he, they heard about the justice of Muslims in areas they conquered much more so than those who claimed to be Christians but did not apply Christian principles and were very sectarian in terms of persecuting of the, uh, the Copts in Egypt. The same thing is in Spain. You compare when Muslims went to Spain, the people who wanted to become Muslim became Muslim. Jews who maintained their Judaism actually had their golden era under Muslim rule. But unfortunately, that was not the case at the time of Inquisition where Muslims were defeated. And if it's assumed that Islam was spread by force, what explains the fact that looking, a cursory look at the, uh, the world map shows that the great majority of the one billion Muslim in the world today live in countries where there was absolutely no fight. The largest Muslim country in the world, Indonesia, was nearly 160 million Muslim. Where was the fight? Where was the conquest? That's the largest Muslim country. The great majority fall in countries where the conquest was not by the force of arms, by, but the force of the teaching and truth of Islam itself. And if Islam was spread by the sword, what explains the fact that historically speaking, right from the time of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, until today, Islam spread much faster at the time of peace than the time of war. Right from the Treaty of Hudaybiyah with the pagan Arabs until these days. If Islam was spread by the sword, what will happen when Muslims no longer have the political and military power they possessed at one time. People will revert back, will go back to their myth, to their own ways. And in fact, in spite of many periods in human history, including, of course, the present period, when Muslims are very weak militarily, economically, in, pro in, in every respect, politically, still Islam continues to spread, and it is reported that today it is the fastest spreading religion in the world. 
How about the spread of Islam even in the West, where there's liberal democracies and total freedom, and no question of compulsion can be raised? How do the hundreds of thousands of people in Western Europe and America embrace Islam unless, again, it is something has nothing to do with, that has nothing to do with the use of brute uh, force? No wonder then we find a more fair writer, and many others, in fact, not one, many, admit that the world has never known more just and more compassionate conquerors than the Arabs. Compare it. Any historian can compare it if the person is really impartial. With the history of conquest in the entire history of the world, nothing, even after Islam, nothing can compare with the tolerance that was shown by Muslim to other people. I must end here by saying that uh, in that particular point, there should be no claim or boasting on the part of Muslim to say that the entire community of Muslims for 1400 years were angels. They have been never any mistake. But the with the admission of imperfection of Muslims as human beings, there is no comparison. There is no comparison. The third issue relates to the question of human rights, and especially the rights of minorities. I must say, first of all, that the foundation of human rights in Islam is ingrained in some verses in the Quran. One clearly indicates that Allah dignified the human race by being human. وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمِ Indeed, we honored the human race. It doesn't say the Muslims. The human race. Furthermore, the Quran makes it clear that the superiority of any human being over any other is by only one single criterion. Not race, not color, not sex, you name it. In Surah 49, especially in passage 13, in the translation of meaning, O mankind, doesn't say O Muslims, doesn't say O believers, O Arabs, O mankind, all of you, we created you from a single pair of a male and female, i.e. you have one parent, you're all brothers and sisters. And then we multiplied you into nations and tribes. Why? So that you get to know each other. The mosaic, as I like, love to call it, mosaic. Where every language is beautiful, every color is beautiful, but more beautiful is all of them together. It's like a bouquet of flowers. A red flower is beautiful in its own right. The white flower is beautiful. The pink is beautiful. But more beautiful is the array of those flowers in a beautiful bouquet to get to know each other. And then it says, Lo, the best of you in the sight of Allah, the most honored of you, is the most righteous indeed. That's an open competition, no restriction. Anyone can sign up. Anyone, male, female, young, old, can sign up for that competition. What could be a more humane, universal type of principle that joins the rest of mankind uh, together? The other aspect of the basis of human rights in Islam is that unlike any secular law, it is derived from divine command. And if it is derived from divine command, it means that no human being or groups of human being or council of religious scholars has any right to revoke them for no human decree supersedes the decree of the creator of all. And that gives these rights greater stability. Fourthly and finally, on this fundamentals of human rights, is that the nature of justice in Islamic law is not a Pax Romana style of justice where there are different layers or different citizenship levels in society. But rather, it is justice to all. In fact, the Quran says you should be just and fair and say the word of truth, even if it be against yourself or your close kins. In one verse in the Quran, it says, even if you hate some people for some reason, if you dislike some people for whatever reason, don't let that feeling prevent you or stop you from doing justice do justice for this is closer to piety. Human rights in Islam, without getting into details, involves, as we indicated earlier, the freedom of belief, freedom of worship, freedom of privacy, freedom of movement and dignity. You compare it with any liberal democracy with some basic qualifications and explanation in terms of Islamic concept. It is not that much different, really. We're not really talking about two worlds apart. The uh, rights of minorities has also been addressed in Islam quite clearly. And many scholars, unfortunately, have reversed the nature of Islamic teaching. For example, the people who are living under an Islamic state, who are non-Muslims, are given a special title, Ahlul Dhimma, Dhimmi. And some people take that as a sort of discrimination, that you know there is an identification of a group of citizens under an Islamic state simply because they're religious minority as Dhimmis. 
And the greatest distortion arise from the lack of understanding of the etymology of the word itself. Dhimmi come from dhimma, which means covenant, which means covenanted people, i.e. minorities that has the covenant of Allah and the covenant of Islam and, and the rulers of Islam that because of their minority status, they shall not be harassed. They have the entire right to practice their faith, to educate their children according to their own faith, and even something unique in Islam that does not exist in liberal democracies today, that no matter how small they are as a minority, they are entitled to have their own personal law, like marriage, divorce, and inheritance, without interference from the law of the majority, even though the majority could be 99.9%. In fact, there is evidence. I remember as a, a young boy going to the high school in Egypt, where Muslims constitute nearly 93%. 93% of the population, that when the religion class came, Muslims stayed in the class, Christian students were gathered from different classes because the time was coordinated together, and their own priest, whether it's Catholic or Eastern Orthodox, gave them their own religious instruction. Nothing was pushed on the throat of anyone because this is exactly what Islam really teaches. Now. Moving to very quickly to the two other issues, I hope I'm not taxing you too much. But uh, on the issue of criminal law, this is a very common thing also. Uh, the common notion, Islam is very barbaric, interested in chopping heads and hands and lashing people in public and all of that. This is something that's not suitable for the 20th century. And uh, there's a, an attitude of fundamentalism among Muslims who say, let's go back, as if go back in time uh, to the laws of the Quran. Let me first of all make a comment that I just leave it at that. That those who say that this is the law of the Quran is barbaric, they forget that if you compare the two scriptures, the Quran and the Bible, you will find that the criminal punishment in Islam as much are much, much softer than the criminal punishment if you go to the Old Testament. I can give you a variety of examples, just one single example. In the Bible, for example, if a virgin person, a virgin girl is raped against her will, if she did not show it so that she would be heard and saved, she herself also would be punished, along with the raper. So she's a victim, but she's punished also as a victim. In the Bible, there is a big list of capital punishments, which is far less than what exists in Islamic law that's regarded as extremely strict. So I mean, comparing a strict, uh, scripture with a scripture, I think the notion that is common in the minds of many people is not necessarily true. I must say in honesty, however, that there are four essential characteristics of criminal law in Islam. One is that, yes, it is strict. It's not too soft. It doesn't say you can go kill and then get only a prison sentence for 10 years, get parole after four years, go out and kill again as it happens. And we see that all the time, especially in North America. I don't know about Britain. I hope it's a little bit more peaceful. But in North America, there are numerous cases of people killing, getting out on parole, killing, and sometimes repeating that two or three times again. So in terms of strictness, yes, it is no nonsense law. There's no question about that. A second characteristic is that the fundamental aspect in Islam is not the threat of punishment, something that's really forgotten by many writers. The fundamental aspect of Islam is to arouse the spirituality and conscience of the individual. That is why no criminal law was revealed to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, or criminal punishment, until the later Mac Madani period. Nothing was revealed in the 13 years in the life of the Muslim community in Mecca. And for most of the 10 years even in Medina, it came gradually. Which means then that the purpose really was not to punish and cut the heads and hands, but the purpose really was to upbring people with the spirituality, with the conscious, with the moral inclination, so that they would not want to commit those crimes in the first place. Yet, as we all know, you cannot exclusively appeal to the conscious of the individual. Any society that exclusively depends on the conscience of the individual is a chaotic society. No modern or civilized society today can say, let this punishment are careful. Let's just appeal to the goodness of the people and goodwill. I mean, it's too simplistic. Ask people in the police and uh, law enforcement. The third is that before any criminal punishment can be applied in Islam, all the reasons leading to that must be rectified first. And I'll come to that when I explain some of the common punishments in Islam. The fourth is that, as a basic principle in Islam, the conditions to implement the more severe and strict criminal punishment are very, very hard, very difficult to prove. 
and there is a principle in law that says that al shubhat that in criminal punishment, if there is any quote unquote shubha, I'll explain it. If there is any shubha, you cannot apply the penalty, or at least you have to reduce it if there is some other evidence. And shubha is not like some people think doubt. Not necessarily just doubt as to whether the crime has taken place or not. <coughs> but doubt also means extenuating circumstances. This is a deeper meaning in the law of what shubha really means. Extenuating circumstances that may not establish the guilt in fullness as it would be in, in the cold-blooded, for example, deliberate murder of a person. Let's take a few examples of the common punishment. Some people would say Islam is barbaric because it calls for capital punishment. But if you look at it carefully, capital punishment, for example, for the murderer. If Islam is barbaric in that, what explains the fact that until recent decades, capital punishment was very common in the so-called advanced and civilized world? Today, even after in Canada and United States, I don't know about Britain, they have been, of course, removal or rescinding of the capital punishment. We find that it has been reinstated already. In several states now, in the United States, capital punishment has been reinstated. In opinion polls in both Canada and the United States, there appear to be a large segment of that civilized and decent society who support that capital punishment should be reinstated, at least in some cases of deliberate cold-blooded type of murder. And I'm sure in Britain, there will be a lot of people also who favor that to put some stop uh, to crime. So why is it only barbaric in the case of Islam? You see, this is sometimes a problem of double standard that we might fall into without really being aware of what we're really attributing to Islam. <coughs> in fact, there is something about capital uh, punishment in Islam that does not exist in any modern liberal law that I know of, that there is a possibility for rehabilitation and forgiveness. In Islamic law, the family of the deceased or the murdered person may, if they feel that there is, this would rectify the situation, may forgive the murderer for a ransom or without even a ransom. And this is something even unique that uh, focus more not on chopping heads, but more on rehabilitation in case there is signs of remorse and the family accept to give up the right on this issue. Take the other issue of adultery, for example. There is a big mistake, again, that some people mix between adultery and fornication. And these have two different punishments in Islam. Fornication, that is by someone who has not been married, the punishment is not capital punishment. Capital punishment in the, in the case of adultery is only for a married person, person who has been married. And if one party has not been married, then he takes his punishment. There is no generalization. You, don't, you take the lesser of the two punishments. But look at the conditions, even though it sounds very horrible type of punishment. Aside from defending it on the basis of being a moral statement of society, of its position vis-a-vis -vis this very destructive element that destroy families and the fabric of society. You can talk about it rhetorically. But look at it legally, even. You cannot implement that punishment unless you have four witnesses who report without hesitation and without changing their minds that they have seen everything in graphic forms. I do not wish to go in greater detail, but if you read in the books of Islamic law how they describe exact sighting of everything, not behind any cover or any doubt, four witnesses, and all of them agree to give witness, knowing that the punishment could be a capital punishment. For someone to commit that act of indecency in such a way that he's seen, of course, by may, more than four, because not everybody would see things were reported anyway, or would be willing to give a witness. It means that there, a person is behaving worse than animals. Worse than animals. Animals are created like that. But for someone to do something like that in public and already is married, it's something that is very horrible that no civilized society, regardless of the nature of the moral standard they accept, can tolerate or accept. In my humble understanding, I understand corrected. There have been no single incident that I know of where that law has been implemented in the 1400 years of the history of Islam on the basis of four witnesses. Name one. I'm not aware. It could be deficiency of my knowledge. I have never seen or read any single case that met all these conditions. The only cases that happened are for people who came and confessed to the Prophet. And even when they came to confess, one or two cases, it says that the Prophet turned his face away from them. Somebody say, oh Prophet of Allah, I am married, I committed adultery, I want to be purified. The Prophet turned his face away. 
giving a signal. If you have done something wrong, go and repent to Allah. Then a man came to him one time and kept insisting. When the Prophet he came back in his face and said, I committed that. He said, well, maybe you just uh, looked. He said, no, I didn't look. It's much more than that. He said, maybe you kissed. No, no, it's more than that. The Prophet is giving him all opportunity. He said, all right, maybe you just touched. No, no. Maybe you just hugged. No. And he kept giving him all kinds of avenues. The man insisted, and the Prophet had no alternative but to say, all right, apply the, the penalty to him, or else the law would be a joke in that case. But the spirit of it shows really that it is more of a statement of the spiritual and moral standard in society than is it for interest of killing people. And the Prophet himself would have loved if that person bugged off, repented, and purified himself in his life, which would not be different from the attitude of many other people following other uh, similar type of religious uh, faith. Take the issue of cutting hands, barbaric. Mutilation of people simply because some poor person felt hungry and stole. To begin with, the conditions are almost impossible also to truly implement the penalty of cutting the hand. It's almost impossible. Some people could abuse it. Some Muslim rulers may abuse it, but that's not Islam. Look at the conditions in Islamic law. First of all, you, ca you cannot punish this severe punishment because of petty theft, petty theft. You have to evaluate the value depending, of course, on the cost of living and so on. But petty theft is not punishable in that extreme form. Number two, again, you have to have the full certainty that this theft has taken place. But more importantly is the concept I mentioned earlier of shubha, that it is not only doubt as to some, uh, whether something happened or not, but any extenuating circumstances. For example, before Islam say, cut the hand of the thief, it said, achieve social justice in order to remove the reason why people steal. It says that if the person steals because of psychological problem, psychiatric problem, he cannot be punished. That's shubha. It's not the same. That's not what is intended for. And let me give you an example of the clear understanding, clear-minded understanding of Islam in the mind of a great Muslim who happened to be the second caliph after Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu a great statesman, Umar. One time, somebody brought his servants to him, and he said they committed theft. He asked them, did you steal? They said, yes. Any person with any background in law says the confession is the master of, of evidence. They confessed, but he did not rush. He said, why did you steal? They said, our master doesn't look after us. He doesn't feed us properly or clothe us. He pushed us into this. And Umar looked at the man, and he said, take them back. And next time, if they steal, I will cut your hand, not theirs. <laughs> in another occasion, there was a famine in Medina. And Umar did not cut any hand, did not order the cutting of any hand. Some people mistakenly, even some Muslims mistakenly, said Umar stopped the application of the law of theft. Umar did not stop it. Umar applied the law of theft in Islam, or punishment for theft, in its appropriate way, which means you don't punish when people are hungry. That is the nature and the spirit of the law. And if it sounds very horrible, even as a statement of moral teaching, I remember reading one time a scholar who said that in a survey that he made for almost 350 years of Islamic rule, seven hands were cut. Now it sounds very offensive that a hand would be cut every 50 years. And I'm sure even if Islamic law has been adhered to more strictly, no hand could have been cut even. One hand cut every 50 years, uh, every 50 years. And now we don't get offended that in North America, in a single city like Detroit or Chicago or New York, there might be scores of people killed while being mugged by thieves. But again, one case is barbaric because one hand is cut in 50 years. But the constant murder every night of scores of people does not offend our sensibility and sense of civilization. I could go on and on, but I hope that this example might suffice to indicate that this myth about the barbaric Islamic law that is interested in chopping hands and cutting heads is not necessarily true. Finally, last but not least, the issue of women Islam. I expect a lot of questions to arise, but let me just give you, provoke you just give us a sort of very brief summary of where Islam stands on this. And I let you be the judge as to whether the notion of women being a less being in Islam is 
truth is fact or, or myth. First of all, on the spiritual level, you find that nowhere in the entire Quran was there a single instance where the finger was pointed to Eve as the reason for the fall of man or temptation to eat from the forbidden tree. Go and read the Quran in Surah 7 in particular, Surah Al-Araf, <coughs> and see what happened. That both Adam and Eve are equally addressed, equally blamed, said to have equally repented and equally accepted by Allah, and as such there is no concept of original sin even to start with. Secondly, whenever the Quran speak about men and women, speak on equal footing in the spiritual sense. One verse in the Quran says that whoever does good deeds or righteous deeds and is a believer, man or woman, God or Allah will give them their abundant reward. They will never be wronged. There is no distinction in terms of reward. The religious and spiritual and moral duties of male and female are the same in Islam, except in some cases where women are giving even concession like not being required to fast in the month of Ramadan if they are pregnant and they could be some harm to their kids, to their fetus, or if they are nursing and they need lots of fluid, they can fast some other time. It's concession even, not to say that they are less than men. So on that, in the spiritual level, it is so clear, especially when you refer to the Quran in Surah number 49, the, ones I, mentioned, the one I mentioned before, إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَابُ the most righteous, the most noble of you in the sight of God is the one who is most God-conscious, righteous person. This, sex has nothing to do with this. On the economic level, it is my understanding that it was in Britain, ahead of many Western nations, in 1860s that we had a series of uh, laws known as Married Women Property Act that for the first time recognized the right of married women to control and dispose of their property without the control of their husbands or their approval or consent. And that was ahead of many nations in Europe, as you know, in France and other places, it came in the 20th century even. More than 1,300 years before the Married Women Property Act, that right was recognized in Islamic law, that a Muslim woman is entitled with, to full control on her personal property before or after marriage. There are certain guarantees that are given economically to women that is not given to men. She is always on the receiving side no matter how rich she is or what property she has before marriage or acquire after marriage in Islamic law, the full responsibility for the household, including her own food, drink, uh, clothing, shelter, medication, is squarely on the shoulder of her husband, unless she wishes voluntarily to help her husband. There are ad additional financial guarantees, again, to, me, to make it rather brief, that you could go on and explain which is given to women but not men. In order to balance that off, man inherits more than woman. But a lot of people look only at the issue of inheritance, but they never look at the other privileges given to women, not given to men. Looking at the totality of rights and responsibility, you see the balance that is even, not only balanced, but I might say even tilted a little bit more towards giving financial security and guarantee to the female sex so that they devote themselves for what Allah has blessed them with best to perform and contribute uh, to society. In the social level, we find that the treatment of children has been emphasized by Prophet Muhammad وسلم, to be based on the fact that they are children regardless of maleness and femaleness. And this is in a society that was very chauvinistic, a society where some ignorant pre-Islamic Arab tribes used to bury their girls alive. And let me give you one example of this. A man was sitting with Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and that man's son came. So the man with the typical chauvinistic attitude held his son, kissed him, put him on his lap. Then his daughter came. He let her sit by him. And the Prophet was so sensitive that he was offended by that. And he told the man, Ma adalt, you did not do justice. You did not do justice. Just as you kissed, that means, that's not the text, as you kissed your son, why didn't you kiss your daughter? As you placed your son on your lap, you've got two legs. Why did you put your daughter also? on the other leg. In fact, the Prophet ﷺ said that if anyone had two daughters and raised them up properly, did not insult them, and really taught them, he and I will come like this in the Day of Judgment. That might sound commonplace today, or at least consistent with the civilized norms, but can we in honesty say that Islam was a reflection of its society, that this was the norm of the seventh century uncivilized part of the world, Arabia at that time. As the girl grows up and the question of marriage is raised, the Quran established the foundation of marriage. 
that you don't get married to your slave or your master because there is only one master for all. And Surah number 30, Surah to room it says, among the signs of Allah, signs of his mercy and compassion and wisdom, that is, that he created for you mates from your same nature and fusikum, the same nature, same spirituality, same soul, that you might find peace and tranquility in them. And he ordained between you, between you love and compassion. These are the two foundations of marriage in Islam, not how Muslims behave. That's their problem, love and compassion. And the Quran speaks about the respect of the opinion of the wife that even in the case of divorce, consultation within the household is required even though the man is the leader of the family, but not a general, a leader to consult like any organized society, but he's still the head of the family, responsible for the family, but he should consult and respect the individuality of his wife. <coughs> Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said the best of you is the best to his family and I am the best of you to my family. I used often, often to say to my brothers, if any of you brothers boast of being a good Muslim, wait a minute, let's get his wife, see what she says about him, how he treats her. That is the acid test. I'm not expecting, of course, that either wives are perfect or husbands, and some wives might be too strict on their husband. But if he doesn't get A plus or B, at least get C plus. At least get a passing mark, a clean bill of health from his wife, then we can believe him that he's truly a good Muslim. But for someone just to observe the outwardly requirement of Islam or even something which is not compulsory to have a robe to have this to have that and think that he's following the Sunnah or the path of the Prophet but not following the other important Sunnah or path of the Prophet in human relationship and does not deal justly with his wife or oppress her then of course he has a very serious problem of understanding what Sunnah or the path of the Prophet indeed means and then as a mother Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam once was sitting and a man came to him and he said to him, this man, tell me, O Messenger of Allah, who among all people in the world are most entitled to my kindness and love, good treatment? And the Prophet said, your mother. And then the man said, who is next? The Prophet said, your mother. The man said, yes, who is next? The Prophet said, your mother. He said, yes, yes. After that, after these three times, he said, and your father. I hope that the brothers will not get jealous. <laughs> the fathers, 75% of the kindness to the mother. Or in Olympic terms, gold medal for the mother, silver medal for the mother, bronze medal for the mother, for the father, perhaps a consolation certificate. <laughs> Finally, on the political arena, and, and when I speak about political involvement of Muslim women in the affairs of their society, or the running of the affairs of the state even, I'm not here speaking about the practices of Muslim or misunderstanding or misinterpretation of Islam. I'm speaking about pure Islam. In the day of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which is the role model for us and the companions of the Prophet, we find that the practice is far depart, or far remote from what we find in many Muslim communities around the world today, including those Muslims who are supposed to be more enlightened, who are living in an open society and should be able to study Islam and not be tied with one particular cultural type of practice. Muslim women at the time of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, participated in all activities in society, but within Islamic etiquette and Islamic rules, which were very limited restriction. But otherwise, they participated fully. In the mosque of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, which is, it was not only a place of worship, it was a place of worship, education, political discussion. It was the expanded parliament for all. Maybe it didn't have a dome like a parliament, but open membership for all. That was suitable for that society. And women, according to many narrations, did participate in that. There was no wall separating men and women. There was no curtain even separating men and women. But since Muslim prayer involves bowing and prostration to the ground, men began to file in the mosque from the first rows backward. Women began to file from the back rows forward, depending, of course, on the crowd and the percentage. This is a very, very just way of accommodating people and children in the middle if you want to consider them like buffer zone or whatever. But that was not separation. To be seated separately because of the nature of the prayer and the rules of decency in Islam did not mean separation in terms of participation. They were full participants. Many women, are, we are told, during the lifetime of the Prophet and companions, were very outspoken. They spoke when the Prophet spoke. They raised questions. They answered questions with full and complete participation. 
even in the battlefield, which some people might consider to be too political. In the most authentic collection of hadith, saying of the Prophet Bukhari, there is a whole chapter about participation of women in the battlefield. Not only on logistical supports, there have been instances where they actually carried arms to defend Islam when Muslims were in great danger from the onslaught of the pagans. By the text of the Quran, it shows that women made bay'ah to the Prophet. And bay'ah is a term that connotes, to some extent, it's not the exact equivalent, election and participation in political aspects of Islam. This is the purity of Islam. If Muslims did not follow that, again, it is their problem. And that's why I said in the introductory remarks that one of the causes of misunderstanding of Islam is not only the biases or prejudices of others. That's part of it. That's part of it. But part of it also is the misbehavior and misunderstanding that could lead actually to misbehavior <coughs> on the part of some Muslims. I believe that within the theme that we have been talking about this afternoon, of the openness, harmony, and education, I believe that before Muslims, or side by side when Muslims try to educate their fellow British citizens about what Islam is all about, I think side by side, Muslims themselves are duty bound to rediscover that heritage, to rediscover that purity of Islam that would help them hopefully become a true mirror of Islam and a good model which would bring not only the admiration but also the harmony and respect of the rest of the segments of the British society. Thank you very much for your patience and make this. Happen.